for our Friday, April 23rd edition of our Campus Chats. My name is Rick Olembeski. I am a member of the class of 1996 and a member of the College Advancement staff here at Randolph-Macon. Uh, we're looking forward to today's conversation with our special guest, Dr. James Scanlon. Our uh, Campus Chats are designed to let our alumni and friends of the college know what's going on on the campus and also to catch up with some familiar faces from days past. Uh, this is an open forum, so please feel free to ask questions and um, engage with Dr. Scano at any time. Um, so without any further ado, uh, let's begin. And uh, it is my pleasure to honor, uh, to introduce today's uh, special guest, Dr. James Scanlon, my former advisor. I have to let everybody know, I've got a picture here of commencement in 1996 with Dr. Scanlon and myself. He was my advisor. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Scanlon joined the Randolph-Macon faculty in 1968, he served as the chair of the history department from 1982 to 1988 and was a member of the planning um, committee for the restoration of Washington Franklin Hall, uh, which is the home of Randolph-Macon's history department today. Uh, and it's also one of the six buildings on Randolph-Macon's campus uh, that is on the National Register of Historic Places. Dr. Scanlon also served as Randolph-Macon's historian he earned his Bachelor of Arts cum laude from, uh, from Georgetown University, his master's from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and his PhD from the University of Virginia. He is the author of numerous articles and reviews, but most famously, Randolph Macon's two books um, on the history of Randolph Macon, the first one from 1825 to 1967, and the second one from 1967 to 2005. If you do not, and Barclay, at least copy. And Barclay Du Priest will take orders. Yes, <laughs> cash and credit. She, I believe, on this call, she will happily get you uh, in on these books. So, um, so with that, welcome, Dr. Scanlon. Well, hello, all of you. Hello. With hello. the exception of Steve Paler, not one of you looks like not only what you look like then, but what you look like the last time I saw you. <laughs> so I don't look like what you're seeing. Okay, that's just different somehow. <laughs> well, we are excited to have you here today. And I thought we'd uh, start off the conversation because you do have a very unique perspective of Randolph-Macon that spans many decades. So with that, What's your, uh, what is your uh, perspective of the evolution of the student culture here at randolph -Macon? I wanna start with a interview I had with one of my father's sisters back in the 70s. <clears throat> and when I was in college, the 1920s had a big aura about them, the roaring 20s. And, so much interesting was happening. And I said, Aunt Peg, what was it like to live in the 70s? And I'm sorry, what was it like to live in the 20s? And she said, you know, we no more thought we were living in the 20s than you think that you were living in the 60s. <laughs> and when we, you and I, were in the 1960s, which date from 63 to 74, we didn't realize we were living in the 60s. It, it just hadn't gelled. And yes, people were dressing differently and different music and drugs that weren't around before. And there's a temptation to think it's always gonna be like this afterwards. And of course it isn't. And when I was, doing the research for the second book, Plug, Plug. I was reading through the Yellow Jacket weekly. And my happiest memories of college were working on the Hoya, which was the Georgetown College paper. And so I took particular interest in the work of student journalists. And the Yellow Jacket Weekly was a very different sort of paper than the one I had worked on. And I had been in college not that long before, maybe seven years. 
And it became clear to me as I read year after year after year after year that what characterized the 60s at Randolph-Macon, which really don't begin until around 1969, Ashland being three, four years behind everybody else, the students had created, and I want your thoughts on this, it was my impression that the students had created a self-conscious culture. And whereas my cohort of students and even the Randolph-Macon cohort of students down to the early chronological 1960s, we wanted to be adults. So we tended to dress like adults. We did what we thought adults things, what adults did. Uh, the college paper that I worked on and, and the yellow jacket, it was a reportage of official events at the school. Uh, sports, certainly, lectures, maybe an article on new professors, although that was rare. Uh, it, it, it was kind of the formal exterior life of the college. But by the, the early 70s, it was about a student worldview that was not only different from the adult worldview, it was opposed to the adult worldview. And a popular slogan at that time was never trust anybody over 30. Another slogan was, if it feels good, do it. When I was in college, if it felt good, it was wrong and you need to go to confession. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Um, and of course, a key person in that era was Luther White. And I'm sitting in the dining room where he and his family used to have dinner. Um, Luther was the last of the Victorians. And there's a portrait of Luther White done by Nancy Witt in the Mullen room and he's wearing a sports jacket and a tie and dress slacks, a very handsome man. And the only thing other than he and the chair and the portrait is a very ornate Victorian lamp. And I remember that lamp, it was in his office. And not long before Nancy died, I had a chance to talk to her. And I said, do you remember doing that portrait? And she kind of smiled. And she said, yes. And I said, do you remember the lamp? And she kind of smiled a little bit more. And she said, that lamp is a very important part of that portrait. And all innocent like, I said, why is that Nancy? And she said, that lamp represents his rigidity, <laughs> his Victorian quality. And he was, he, he, he was the last of the Victorian era. And it was his misfortune to be president of a college when all of the Victorian, Edwardian, and even 1930s sexual morality rules had collapsed. And he was just driven crazy by it. I don't mean that literally, but it was frantic because um, he, he couldn't figure out a way to keep the boys and girls out of each other's dormitories. And somebody asked him why he wanted to stop it. And he said, well, if the boys are allowed to go into the girls' dorms, the girls are going to lose their identity. <laughs> Note the word. Uh, there were certain words he couldn't bring himself to use in public. <laughs> we all kind of marveled that he had four children. Anyway, um, and so he threw students out for being in the uh, girls' dorm. And Bill killed off. What was the name of the young man who was kicked out by Luther? who later became a lawyer, and he was on a board of a school in Richmond with you? Yeah, I'm trying to, he, yeah. It was Charlie. Um, yes. Charlie Mahines. I don't remember the last name. Uh, Charlie. Eventually, Charlie. Yeah. eventually, Luther gave up trying. He, he just gave up trying. And 
at one point, a, a mother called and complained to Luther that her daughter was here and the daughter had a roommate who was inviting boys into the dorm room for the night. And Luther said, well, I really can't do anything about it. You'll have to, uh, we'll try to get her a different roommate or, or have her move rooms. So Luther had given up trying to impose Victorian morality. But the students still resented him and they still criticized him. There was one editor of the Yellow Jacket who supported him, a young lady, I've forgotten her name, but all the other, I didn't do that. All... Sorry. <laughs> that one of our clocks. <laughs> um, all the other editors after the first year were highly critical of him. And finally it dawned on him it wasn't what he was doing because he had stopped doing it. What, they, what students of the time resented was he criticized their culture. And it was their culture and they, they treasured it and guarded it. I don't know if they kept it 20 years later. That's something you could talk about. But it seems to me that there, there developed then a, 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 a culture of students for students into which adults were an unwelcome intrusion. And I just wanna throw that idea out to you and, and see what your, what your reaction is to it. So Rick, do you wanna moderate? Sure, uh, everybody, you can, uh, if you're muted, you can unmute yourself, but um, please join in the conversation and we'd love to hear your perspective and your answers. So just uh, freely go ahead. Uh, David, you raise your, raise your hand. Okay. Um, uh, oh, hi, David. James. Hey, James. You don't uh, look James. like you either. Uh, <laughs> David, by the way, are you still mayor? I okay. am. He is the am. Lord, Lord High Mayor of Falls Church City? Uh, Fairfax City. Fairfax City, I beg your pardon. Don't you have a gold chain to go around <laughs> like an English mayor's did? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> well, um, I, I believe that Professor Scanlon and I were on the Commission for Enrollment. In we the were, fall of, yes. On the fall of you 1970. You were a freshman. You were president of the freshman, freshman class. You have an ironclad memory. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I almost forgot I was meeting here today and I almost took my car out to run it. <laughs> you know what they said about Blackwell, the president? People did not know what was more amazing, what he remembered or what he forgot. <laughs> well, I'm in the same condition, but thank you, David. Go ahead. Well, um, this is all shared not as a criticism nor. Um, just for historical, for this historical record, and you know, I, um, I, I want to to say that I um, had an ambivalent relationship with with Luther White, and uh, and yet uh, from a through from from the perspective of of almost fifty years, um, you know, I look back as an as a as a decided adult, and and I I want to have the compassion and try to understand his experience from his perspective in the position that he was in. That's not in any way to make an excuse for anything, but I will tell you that based on this commission and for enrollment, um, the trustees decided that the fall of 1971, that we would have our first residential women on campus. And so they were in Mary Branch dorm and there clearly was a, those 52 women were clearly treated differently in, 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 in many respects. And um, including uh, the, the men's dormitories had no locks on the doors. The doors were unlocked all night long and were wide open. And um, uh, the one campus police officer would lock the doors at, of Mary Branch at a, uh, uh, at midnight, the library closed at 11, and um, everyone was supposed, all of the females were supposed to be inside. Well, 
the women started propping the doors open. They started as 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 James had has shared had women coming in. I mean, had had male visitors coming in. Some were just friends. It wasn't for purely uh, hanky panky, period uh, <laughs> reasons or anything. And um, so I guess it was probably in late October, uh, back when they still had the uh, lobby in the in the lower level, the 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 the, the the reception room on the first floor of Mary Branch Middle. So Luther called all of the women who were in the dormitory together and Patricia was with him. And he was, he said, I want to talk with you and impart to you my, my concerns about your behavior. And um, I don't think it's appropriate. It's not good for you. It's not good for the college. And, um, so somebody said, well, what exactly do you mean? Because he was being a bit obtuse. And <laughs> Luther said, well, you're, you're behaving like loose, tainted women. Uh. <laughs> not, not a uh, comment that would endear students of any gender to him, either gender, I should say. But anyway, and that was the beginning of a a really torturous relationship that he had with students, as you noted. And then, uh, and I'll just share one other anecdote with you that I personally witnessed, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. Um, of course, we had had Muhammad Ali come to the campus in 1968, I guess, and, and that was a rather controversial uh, visit. And so Luther was very um, hesitant about having uh, any outside speakers that he didn't personally approve. Well, the class of 1971 wanted to invite their own graduation speaker. And I can't remember who they had in mind, but it was someone of a more liberal persuasion. And the, so the leadership of the class of 71 was at loggerheads with the president. And so they decided to have a, uh, a meeting to discuss this in Haley Hall. And um, so, so I actually went out of curiosity and um, was sitting against the wall. And uh, all of the most of the senior leadership of the senior class was in the room, and um, including Haywood, uh, Blakemore, Bob Rankin, Bob Lambeth, um, uh, this fellow Bill Smith, Dave Huckabee was there with his tape recorder. And uh, Luther walked in and uh, Luther looked at me and he said, David Meyer, what are you doing in here? <laughs> I didn't say anything. And um, so Luther kept saying, we're not going to have a graduation speaker coming in here and embarrassing the college. The college is graduation is when the college puts on its finest suit and he would tug on his lapels. And um this, this went on in this kind of a circular conversation for a while, wasn't going anywhere. And um, if you recall, at this point in history, Rich Little was a comedian that did a lot of imitations of Richard Nixon. And uh, his famous line was, I am the president. And Rich Little would hold his fingers up in the V and imitate Nixon saying, I am the president. And a very conservative member of the class of 1971, Benny Ko, who was from uh, Hong Kong, <clears throat> spoke up, which he usually didn't. And he said, uh, President White, he says, I, uh, you say we can't have our graduation speaker. By what authority do you make this statement? <laughs> and Luther, Luther turned to the room without any hint of, or awareness of the irony and said, well, I am the president. And the class started howling. I mean, it was just people were, were laughing uncontrollably. And the look on, on Luther's face was that he didn't understand why that was so funny. He, he was completely unaware of, of the reference to his, in, his inadvertent reference to Rich Little. And um, <clears throat> so, I, those were just two instance, instances of his um, earlier years 
where he was struggling to adjust to have a relationship with student body. So I will, uh, I just share those anecdotes with you and I will stop talking. Alan Rashkin wants to say something, Rick. Uh, Dr. Dr. Scanlon, thank you for, um, for uh, hitting the nail on the head. Uh, Luther White was just the wrong man yeah. at, the, at the wrong time. I mean, he, he would have been great in the 50s. But yes. At, yes. At, at the period of time he came in, and I, yeah. I don't have anything he, he, as... He's as, almost uh, a tragic figure in a way. Yeah, in, in a way. And at that 1971 graduate, which I, graduation, which I attended because my brother Mike graduated that year, Luther was booed. And I felt bad. I felt was bad. Was that for the him. year the president of the class was Bill Smith? And I don't. I don't remember. I tried against Luther White as commencement. Yes, officer. Bill Smith was the president. He yeah. was convening that meeting in Haley Hall. Yeah. Well, it, and it was, I, I felt sorry for Luther at the end of Bill Smith's speech. So, yeah. Um, I I felt I actually felt sorry for Luther, although um, I recognized early. I'd actually met him before I came to Randolph Macon. Mm -hmm. I'd been introduced to him as a Randolph Macon stalwart, and that he was. And, and I wrote an article in the uh, Yellow Jacket Weekly when we were looking for a president saying that what we need is an academician. And of course, now that I know what a president does, that's the last thing we needed, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but I, the, the, the one thing, I, 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 I had this conceit that Luther and I could reason with one another. Mm -hmm. and, and that was of course uh, worthless. And we were trying to build a new AE Pie house. He wanted to put it on the other side of the railroad tracks. Yes. So I went to see him when he was trying to talk us out of building uh, where the, I think it's now the speed house is. And I said, you know, I, I said, well, he, we've got real problems with doing it. Well, what are your problems? Well, first of all, the heating plant doesn't extend to that side of the, the mm. uh, railroad. So if we go over there, we have to install a brand new heating plant and that will increase the cost tremendously. All right, what else do you have? I said, the other thing is, and our fresh, my freshman year, one of our classmates was killed on the railroad tracks right there. And I said, you know, I, I don't think it's a great idea to have fraternity mm -hmm. houses on the other side of the railroad track, mm -hmm. uh, given what happens at fraternity houses. And Luther White looked at me and he said, assuming arguendo, I could take care of those two problems. And wise ass that I was then and am now, I said, does assuming arguendo mean that you could make those two problems disappear? And he said, yes. I said, if you could make them disappear, I wouldn't have any problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, that, that got us nowhere. Right. Uh, and that was pretty much, I, I also had talked to him about women in the door, um, men in the women's dorms. Uh, at that point, it would be women in the men's dorms. And uh, there was just no budge, none. As, as a lawyer, he was surprised that he needed the town to change the zoning of that property and the town wouldn't do it. And it's still empty. It's still empty. <laughs> wow. For those of you who don't know his, his background, he's very important in the history of the college. And, 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 and he, he did agree to go in co-ed uh, as women as residential students. And it was crucial in saving the school. Exactly. He had driven off 20 some percent of the student body. But I mean, Randolph Macon flourishes today because of, of the women and a majority of the students here are women. You met him in, in the Norfolk area. He was a very distinguished lawyer. And his connection with the college was he was president of the Alumni Society and on the search committee and he impressed people and he had a reputation for being a fundraiser for the Norfolk Symphony. And I, I asked him, since he didn't come from an academic background, where did he get his idea of how to run the school? And he said he, he got it from uh, Dr. Moreland. Hmm. Well, he, Luther was here for a year, then went into World War II, was in the Navy, was an officer in the Navy, and then came back like a, a vast generation did and, and graduated in a, in, a, in a short period of time and then went on to law school. Very Dr. good as a lawyer. Dr. Scan, we have, but, uh, I believe I see a hand here. But uh, let, me, let, me, let me finish one okay. point about this. He, no undergraduate and most faculty don't understand what a president of a college does. 
I certainly didn't when I was an undergraduate and I didn't when I started teaching. And it's been my good fortune to be on a couple of presidential cabinets and getting to know presidents and, and going through all of their correspondence. So I've often wondered where his model for being a college president came from. And, my, and he did not say this, but my instincts are that his model was his experience as a Naval officer. Mm -hmm. And Bob Offenbacher, if you remember him, was a Naval officer as well. And Bob and, and Luther had a rapport and, and Bob used to have coffee with him frequently. And Luther just couldn't understand why he told people to do things and they didn't do it. <laughs> so I, I don't want to drift off about the question of culture. So um, were you aware when you were here that you were creating a culture or was it just instinctive? R Rick, where yes, are you? Yes, there's, there's three people the, the who- The pictures uh, keep moving around. <laughs> Uh, first person I saw, uh, uh, Berman, and then Chris, and then Jack. Uh, Berman, do you want to unmute yourself? And I'm uh, nice to see you, Dr. Scallon. Thanks for, um, for thanks for today. Well, My you're very welcome, Berman. I didn't recognize you. I don't think I've ever seen you in glasses. Well, that's what happens when you. Um, but don't don't tell okay, me. I'm not going to say that. Don't I don't I don't need to hear this. <laughs> I just I, saw I, my I, doctor in January. <laughs> In effect, she said, you're in pretty good shape for the shape you're in. <laughs> but, the, but the way she expressed it was for a man your age. Mm. So if you haven't heard those magical words, that's what you have waiting for you. Go ahead, Berman. I think I'm, I'm going to, uh, my question back to you is if Luther White had a challenge in 1971 with not criticizing their, their culture, what landmines must a college president avoid today? What advice would you give a college president today with respect to don't criticize what culture? Cultures, plural. How does that, how do you navigate that? Well, and, and it took me a very long time to understand this myself. Anybody who becomes the president of anything, college or the United States, anyone who becomes the president of anything or whatever equivalent title, no longer has the luxury of an opinion <laughs> because anything a president says is interpreted as policy. And poor Liddell Payne, who succeeded Luther White, couldn't understand that and couldn't understand why he upset the faculty who had had a lot of, the faculty had a lot of problems with Luther White as well. Uh, and, and Payne just would make these offhand remarks attempting to be witty and I don't know if you've ever walked into a hen roost or a turkey roost. I have. And the birds begin flapping and squawking. <laughs> the faculty are just like that. They just we get upset, we flap our wings and carry on and then eventually settle down. Um, you, you can't have a private opinion. You simply can't have a private opinion. Anything you say is policy, therefore you have to speak in cliches and it's very annoying to people. Um, and sensitivities have changed as you know, so much in the last 20 years that you have to follow the old diplomats rule, never say anything disparaging. And, uh, you may not know this, but I like to joke and I like to laugh and I pay attention to professionals who do it. And in the old days, comedians made a nice living going to college campuses then they can't do it anymore because college students don't like jokes because jokes essentially always are making fun of somebody else. And the people who succeed today are people like David Sedaris, who makes a vast amount of money because he's very entertaining, but he always talks about himself hmm. and his foibles. Oh. So I, I don't know, Berman, if that answers your question, but it, it, you, you have to be, a, a college president just can't have an opinion and can't say anything disparaging. 
Um, and, and that way you, you try to keep the feathers from being ruffled and the, the faculty perched quietly and happily on their roosts. <laughs> Thank Rick. you. Um, so I want to uh, <laughs> let everybody know we're, we're going to continue. We are at one o'clock, but we're going to continue. Um, if you can't um, continue joining us, please know that this is being recorded and you can see the remainder, but we welcome uh, all those who can stay to stay also. And also, if you are leaving, don't forget about our next campus chat next week with April Marchetti. Uh, but I want to continue. And Chris, you had a question. If you can, uh, and then Jack, I'll get to you after that. Chris, if you can unmute yourself and um, the floor, the Zoom floor is yours. Dr. Scanlon, good to see you again. Hi, Chris. We How weren't together that long ago when, when, when I was there for that uh, KA anniversary and you yes, spent the day right. with us. Yeah. That was nice. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, to bring up the fact that in, in relation to the creation of, of quote unquote culture, one of the things about Luther White was his um, alliance, if you will, with Ira Andrews. Uh, Ira had a had the implementation aspect of mm -hmm. uh, Luther's quote policies, mm -hmm. and I remember one of the things being of a historical bent myself, and part part of that thanks to you, um, we had a problem with the erasure mentality that Luther had. Uh, we would leave for a summer vacation and come back, and yet another old building will have bitten the dust. Um, the summer of uh, Sandy Davis, you'll remember this. You were my generation. We would we came back from our I think our freshman year um, um, summer break, and the, the old gym yeah. had been torn yeah. down. It, it was your Christmas break. Christmas, yeah. Break. Oh, was it Christmas? Yeah. It Christmas, and then yeah. and then the following year, we we went away for one of the breaks and came back, and the and Pace Hall was was gone. Um, and uh, Sandy, you I think you were a part of that small committee that we formed that was known back then as the Save Wash Frank Hall Committee. Yep, I remember. And at that point, we were the, the spearheads that, that kept him from tearing down Wash Frank Hall, which was satisfying. Um, but I think, Sandy, we were like, what, the, maybe the second entering class that included women? Yes, we were class of 77. So we started and we had and we had um, campus security head headed by uh, Officer Ratliff. Yep. Uh, affectionately known as Deputy Dog. Oh, who, God, you're killing me. <laughs> who uh, used to cruise. I thought the Earl Coons was Deputy Dog. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, That's maybe what I was secondarily. Told. But but Ratliff used to cruise the the parking lots between between the yes. dorm, uh, uh, the, the motel dorms looking in the windows to see if there were any women present. <laughs> and then at, at one point we had a sit-in at New Dorm, which was very widely attended. Right. That was a, a, a protest of the visitation uh, policy uh, and the, the, the no men in the women's dorms, because once again, it was not a reflection necessarily of the hanky-panky aspect, but just that, that it was a socialization aspect. Yeah. And we had a problem with the fact that he denigrated our social relationships um, by the implementation of that of that rather restrictive policy. Uh, but he was like like you said, he was he was president a very instrumental time as part of my personal protest uh, to him. I had my senior picture taken at his desk. <laughs> he was absent, and of course, the Luther White nameplate was at the front of the desk, and I had my <laughs> picture taken in his leather chair behind the desk. But he he was a character. He I would go so just a quick interjection. I would go so far as to say that Luther, to look at the glass half full, was actually a unifying figure. Ah, yes, 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 yes. For, for our yes. general, for our class in particular. That's yeah. the one thing we all had in common was our opposition. Well, that <laughs> sit-in, that sit-in we had at yeah. then New Dorm. I can't remember what the the dorm mother's name was. Sandy, do you remember? She was the nicest lady in the world. She I was a sweetheart. Sweet as she, she was Mama about Jay, four, four, eleven. Yeah. And the, was, and the and the strategy is we would usually go in pairs or triples, and somebody would would distract her while two or three other guys went upstairs. 
<laughs> you know what? She knew what was going on. Uh, yeah, yeah. She was she was selectively ignorant. Let me put it that way. But I can't remember her name, but she was a sweetheart. You know, it was Jackson. Jackson. That's this is right. Jack. That's, it. That's right. She would and your, us. your senior photograph is iconic. <laughs> Thank you. Of college. Let, well, me, that's it. let me say something about the destruction of the old gym. Students today, if the, will call the alumni gymnasium the old gym because they've heard the term old gym and it's right. old and a gym. The destruction of that building goes back to Moreland. And Moreland, did, being a man of his generation, didn't like old things. And he wanted it torn down. And Moreland persuaded Frank Brown that it ought to be torn down. Frank Brown was the only member of the board of trustees who gave significant amounts of money. And I argued with Luther to save the old gym. It was in perfect physical shape. There's nothing wrong with it. Our mailboxes were there. Yes, and right. it was the scene of dances for the Commons Club. So it was, it was a sound building. But Luther said to me, the college has a moral commitment to Mr. Brown to tear it down. So it, was, it wasn't entirely his choice. Well, that, that whole thing was kind of a, ref a reflection of a national mentality at the time. There was yeah. the urban renewal movement yeah. that, that many cities, including Norfolk, which I would, I'm a native of Norfolk, and uh, vast amounts of our architectural heritage were erased mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for the idea of urban renewal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that what happened with the old, old gym and with, with the old science building was kind of a reflection of out with the old and in with the new. Well, the old science building was in really terrible shape. It was. It, it was in very bad, very bad, bad shape. But it had the most interesting artifacts in it. Um, <laughs> be, be, being, being a KA, we were across the driveway. In, in the room, in the secret room under the observatory? There was, there was one room that was formaldehyde jars of fetuses in various stages ah. of development. And I thought, I mean, I thought it, it was the room filled with women's clothing. Now, wait, I never saw that. Well, that's what I was told. <laughs> never saw but, it myself. But either. like I said, the, the, the sad part is the loss of the architectural heritage. Yeah, absolutely. And I am, I am, it just thrills me to death to this day to, to see the state of Wash Frank Hall which yeah. is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And that's 30 years old now. <clears throat> yeah. 30 years old, that's yeah, that's right. restoration. I, I wanted to raise another question, and I don't, you, you want to talk about the student culture, that's fine. But another, another the, one, the only other thing I wanted to ask you, and I used to ask this of alumni, not in any systematic way, When you graduated from here and you went to work or you went to law school or you went to get an MBA or you went to graduate school or medical school or you got jobs, you were mingling with people who had graduated from other colleges. Did you feel outclassed in your education? Did you think other people had a better education? Than you? I, no. I, and you always meet somebody who knows something you don't. That's not I, what I, I, I want to answer that quickly and say Please. absolutely not. And I think all the uh, political science majors or people who went to law school who had um, Howard Davis um, were ahead. And I remember distinctly um, you know, you have these study groups in uh, law school and you divide up the, the course and you, you discuss it. And, and uh, I was in a, a group with people from, you know, um, Ivy League schools, uh, mm -hmm. UVA. And mm -hmm. one of the guys from UVA was a high school classmate of mine at one point. And we were discussing this constitutional law issue. And I started going on about something. And they said, where did you get that? We've never had that. Uh -huh. and, I, and I thought about it. Oh, I know where I got that. I got that through Howard Davis <laughs> okay. sending me to the law library and insisting that I read this 100 page law review article in the Harvard, it's actually 99 wow. pages in Harvard Law. I was ahead of wow. my classmates. And Bruce Unger too. Bruce yep. 
I, Bruce, Bruce, Bruce's first year was my last, just as Dr. Scanlon's right. first year was, was my last, but um, I, I was ahead. And, I, and I've heard that story told by many generations of people who've gone on. Bill, would, Bill Kildoff, would you agree with that? I was hampered because I was a history major. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but yeah, well, Scanlon talked me into double majoring political science and history when I asked him to let me change to history. He said, no, let's make you a double major. But I, I definitely felt uh, very well prepared for law school, and uh, I, I thought I was ahead of the game. I agree. I could not agree more. I want to. I want to give uh, Jack. You've had your hand no, up. No, that's all right. Um, I got to jump off, James. It's great to see you. Good to see you, see Jack. You. I have to jump my, off. I'll my question next. was to to sort of of wrap up our discussion with Luther White, and I would rather talk about uh, how we found ourselves prepared uh, in the world rather than my question about Luther White. Well, talk about how you were prepared in the world, or is he gone? Uh, well, I think, and that that ties back. Well, it it does tie back to him. Um, I was one year behind Alan Rashkin, uh, Doctor Scanlon's second year there. Uh, I think so. Good to see you. We go back a long time. We <laughs> do. I remember seeing you star in a musical. <laughs> the that's, a, that's a long time ago yeah. anyway don't um, ask me about last week <laughs> I, uh, in addition to how prepared i like to comment to people that uh, us sort of writ large around the same age went to college at the absolute most exciting time um, to go to college in the United States of America. And you think about it, um, Woodstock was when we were there. Um, the moratorium, which I'll come back to, Vietnam, all of the social unrest, political unrest going on, it was, all the music changes. It was a fantastic time. Um, don't, be don't leave out May of 1970, after the Kent State. Yeah, I mean, and that the, the was college the college teetered on the brink of being shut down, and many universities were shut down. We yeah. did not, and I think it was because the faculty and students knew each other. And I remember being out in the Fountain Plaza till one o'clock in the morning talking to students, and not alone, not alone. A lot of other faculty were there as well. Yeah. I remember when the Fountain Plaza was built. It was yeah. built yeah. for yeah. The, yeah. The, time, <laughs> the time I was there. But circling back quickly to Luther White, um, this, this discussion answers a question that I have had for uh, probably um, 30 years. And, and that was why uh, I seemed to have made such an impression on President White when I was a student. Uh, because for the rest of his life, when I would see him, and it would almost always um, be at some function on the campus, he knew me and he knew me by name. Mm -hmm. And he would walk across a room to come and seek me out and find mm -hmm. out how I was doing. And this sort of answers that because um, <clears throat> When I graduated in 1970, and I think my, the Kent State year, and I think the last year or so, my roommate, Dennis Harding, was the editor of the Yellow Jacket Weekly. And Dennis was, at the time, just hyper-politically sensitive. So he was heavily involved in what was going on in campus. In fact, it was he that orchestrated the edition of the newspaper that was called The Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And it talked mm -hmm. about Randolph Macon wallowing in the puke of its old mediocrity, own mediocrity. It had a tear off front page that said the Yellow Jacket Weekly, you tear off the front page and there's a new mess, The Phoenix. Um, 
and anyway, that cost him his job uh, as as editor. But the entire time I was there, I mean, I remember Luther being called on the stage um, to sort of confront student leaders during the moratorium. Um, on the other hand, so Jack, I do you want to explain what the moratorium was? Yeah, the moratorium was a a proposed cancellation of well the rest of a of a year's classes but final exams um i think it was and i'm guessing it was either in 1968 or 1969 no no it was it was the kent state yeah it was 19, well that would be 1970 yeah it was 1970, 1970 yeah people uh, wanted okay. to to cancel finals and, yeah. and the rest of and, the semester which was a week or two right and you had the option of of choosing to do that if you wanted to or that was the final compromise right or having and having the final in the fall right. which i couldn't do because i was graduating um but anyway luther white i can recall he and his wife uh, on party weekends they would come by the fidel house and and visit with us maybe he did that for every fraternity on campus i don't know um, I think he was a Fidel. And so throughout my college career, especially Dennis, Dennis Hardig, my roommate, was particularly antagonistic to Luther. And I don't think I was particularly antagonistic to him. I didn't even think I was really visible to him other than being polite to him when he came to the fraternity house. But I, so I never could realize why he seemed um, to be able to remember me and make an effort to seek me out at Randolph Macon Functions and ask how I was doing and so forth and so on. And, but I think this sort of answers it because, well, I wasn't mean to him oh. um, when, uh, when he was here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't go to any lengths to be particularly nice to him, mm -hmm. but I was not mean to him. Right. You were courteous. So, polite. Right. And I was polite. And so perhaps, yeah. um, you know, perhaps I was just a memory of not all of them were terrible. Right. And so I'll remember this one. But I, I'm so glad I just checked into this, um, this Zoom call because... Yeah, I mean, that that answers uh, a question uh, that I've had for a long time, and I better understand. It. And by the way, it's good to see not only you, Dr. Scanlon, but all the other people on here. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, uh, Chris again. I have a little story relative to our we were in a kind of a womb at, at Randolph-Macon. Uh, we were all close. I mean, it was a small school. We knew our professors, we knew each other. Uh, we crossed uh, uh, class lines between a junior and a senior or a sophomore and a, and a senior. Um, one evening, one o'clock in the morning, I am walking across the Fountain Plaza headed for my dorm room and I notice uh, Dr. Gray, sitting on one of the stone benches um, with his elbows on his knees. And I uh, initially thought that maybe he had just gotten to the point that he couldn't make it home. If those of you that knew Dr. Gray understand what I'm talking about. Um, so I went to him to see if I could walk him home. I said, Dr. Gray, is, are you okay? He said, well, Chris, not really. He said, I, I just got the news that a dear friend of mine has passed away and they have called me to ask what to do, what, what, what provisions to make for the disposal of his remains. Mm. And I said, well, I'm really sorry. He said, yeah, and, I've, and the first thing I've got to do is I've got to call Tennessee. 
And I, I said, well, who do you, who is, is it a relative of the deceased that lives in Tennessee? He says, no, not the state Tennessee, Tennessee Williams. Right. <laughs> come so to find really out. know these people. Yes, come to find out the friend who had passed away was Ezra Pound. Ooh. <laughs> and oh, they called oh. him to find out what to do with Ezra Pound's body. Okay, Ooh. so here we are at this little liberal yeah. arts college yeah. in Virginia, and there were people around us that knew people of 20th century major consequence. And they imparted that relationship to us. Um, I mean, uh, W.H. Dr. W. H. Auden, the great poet, came to Randolph-Macon twice, and both times he stayed in Bill Gray's apartment. Yeah, that figures. Because of Bill Gray. That figures. He, he knew every major literary figure of the first half of the 20th century. It was really quite amazing. And, and there were occasions that he would teach a class uh, laying on his desk on his back, <laughs> talking, talking to the ceiling. He was, he was an amazing that. individual, amazing. Well, I will tell you another story about Bill Gray. And I was on a, on a train going from Vienna, Austria to Graz, Austria with Bill Gray. And um, this was in 1973, and um, the train stopped in a little town in between uh, Vienna and Graz. And Bill Gray said to me, he says, well, this is where I get off. And I said, well, wait a minute. He said, I'll be in Graz in a couple of days. Mr. Auden has a summer home here and I'm going to spend the weekend here with him. Wow. And he just got off the train and left me by myself. And uh, I thought to my, I, I thought, here's probably one of the greatest living uh, men of literature in the world. <laughs> and he's getting off this little train in this little town in Austria to go spend the weekend with him. It was, it was it, yeah, it was interesting. But I have a question for, for James, if I may. Um, back to the issue of the role of a president and um, the fact that they can no longer have an opinion. I, um, and let me add parenthetically that Jack's comment about- I, I say that They can't say an opinion. I can't <laughs> share, can't they can't share an opinion. I, they can't share an opinion. Right. How does a college president or any president, but particularly a college president, Given those constraints, how do they at the same time address core issues, not just in society or core, core issues that face an institution and, and also create a, a, a vision for a new path forward for alumni, students, faculty, and how, how do they find that sweet spot between not antagonizing anyone, but still at the same time establishing a vision that can lead the organization in a new in a new way. Well, I was on the strategic planning commission that Modell Payne set up. And the way Payne did it, and Payne was very good at, once he realized he couldn't say what he thought, you, you create a, con, a consensus or you try to create a consensus by forming a group that has representatives of the various constituencies. You have, such as the um, admissions commission, the enrollment commission that you were on, uh, Dave, you have students, you have faculty, you have administrators, you have trustees. And you let them talk and you present them with the problems and let them try to come up with a, a solution. And naturally you're going to get a lot of difference of opinion. And sometimes it gels into one and sometimes it doesn't. And a good president or a good chairman has to know at what point you've gone as far as you're going to get with that group. 
and when they start talking in circles, and, and they do, I've chaired an awful lot of meetings, it's time to adjourn and let people think about things and then reconvene them. And you, you try to come up with a consensus of a way forward that most of the constituents of the college can agree with. So it, it really demands uh, the skill of intuition. It demands the skill of listening. You have to listen and listen and listen. And you keep your opinions to yourself and, and let, let things gel. From time to time, you throw out a little gentle suggestion, a little trial balloon. And, and you, you have to kind of just nudge the group forward. And then you have to sell it. And another constituency that you, that you don't usually have with you are the donors. Because very often a major change involves a great expenditure of money. And, and that's where the, the trustees are important because they have a sense of what the donors think because they're often donors themselves. And the development office, advancement office, as it's now called, they'll have a sense. You have to, you have to deal with uh, what you can get done. D does that help, Dave? Well, it helps immensely, and and because you uh, have the same problem, don't you, as a mayor? I do, and I was thinking about this as you were speaking. I was thinking, I never stopped learning from my my faculty at Randolph Macon. <laughs> mm -hmm. Seriously, I'm not blowing smoke. I'm not blowing smoke at all. Seriously. Well, you're not getting a grade on this, so it doesn't matter. It's a pass, <laughs> well, it's a pass fail chat. Well, at this point, almost everything in life is pass fail. <laughs> but I will say that I do agree with what Jack's, Jack said a few minutes ago. Your, your insights into our college experience of 50 years ago, was, it's been very helpful to me today. It's well, helped you. put things in perspective. And, and it's also, I, I, when I reflect on this discussion, I'm looking at it generically as to what you just shared because it does also help. We're, we're facing some tenacious and vexing issues in the city relative to our, our past and, and uh, reconciliation with social justice issues and a history of segregation. And we're trying as a community to address that here in Northern Virginia in, in Fairfax. And um, how we go about doing that is, you know, we're, on, we're in uncharted waters. Yes. And, yes. I, and I, I think and you're, you're not alone. And right, and your 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 counsel has been spot on. So thank, well, thank you so you. much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've heard a lot about the '70s, and it was a very exciting era. But I see a couple of people, Steve and Dean, who are from the '90s, and I, I wondered if any of the discussion helped illuminate your very important four years here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just Speaking for myself, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, to, to speak just briefly too on that issue of preparedness, I mean, for me, it's never ceased to amaze me how astonished other people are that I can count as mentors uh, and friends, people like yourself who, who were not in my major. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's, it's amazing to me how surprising that is to so many people. Yeah. That, uh, that, that, that that's similar to the kinds of uh, the, com the learning community that make yeah. it out of the oh, time. Yeah. It's always interesting to hear about the history too of how, how we got to some of those points, I think, yeah. that to be so acceptable. Yeah. I've, I've, I've gotten to know a lot of students who weren't majors. And you know, that, that's, I, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. And one I did not make was when I was in graduate school, thinking about where I wanted to be as a career, and I decided I wanted to be in a small school. And I let that be known. And when George Oliver was looking for somebody to teach colonial and US history and called the chairman of the UVA, it was a, a professor 
he remembered me because in a seminar, he said, are there any questions? And I said, yes, Mr. Peterson, there's something I don't understand. And he swelled as all professors do because they could show off. And I asked my question and he looked at me with his pale, cold blue eyes and said, Mr. Scanlon, you've destroyed my entire lecture. Uh, but he remembered me. And he knew I wanted to teach in a small school. And, and so my name was suggested and I came and was interviewed. And, and frankly, they were desperate. So, so here I was. I like to get to know people. I'm a very shy person. It's very hard for me to get to know people. And I like to get to know people and I like to understand things. And you, you can understand a school like Randolph-Macon. I don't think it is possible for anyone to understand a school with 40,000 students in it and how many thousands of faculty. So it, it's, I am a firm believer in small colleges. Not, not everyone is. When I went to Georgetown, the college part of Georgetown had 1,000 or 1,100 students in it. Uh, didn't have the closeness that the faculty and students have here. But I, I wanted to be approachable, and many of you found me approachable. So. Dr. Scanlon, um, I'm going to take, uh, take one more question. But I think this, uh, this, this chat has been great today so much. Shameless plug, but just like your book, there's a volume one. And I think this chat needs to continue to volume two, where you can get these books in the bookstore by contacting Barkley the priest. She is standing by. But there is one person that's been uh, wanting to ask you a question. And, and Kristen Trailer, um, the floor is yours. And then we'll uh, wrap up with that after this. But before we say goodbye, I just want to say hello to Robert Thomas and tell him that I was introduced. I'm sorry, Robert Thomas, and was Chuck Thomas here? Yes. He's still uh, on. Father and son. And when I was introduced to Bob Thomas by the president, he said, it's Robert, but the president missed that. And I just said, are you related to Chuck? And how, you know, decades earlier, I remember Chuck and the fraternity he was in. And so, you yeah. have, Chuck, you have a lovely son, and he was a pleasure to know. One last question, and if we don't take time with that, I'll tell my Moreland story. Kristen, go ahead. Mine will be quick. So, um, Dr. Scallon, I wanted to oh, tell hi. you that I just uh, finished reading volume two a couple of weeks Here's ago. one. I heard somebody had read it. <laughs> yes, and, um, and when I saw that you were speaking, I thought, oh, this is so timely, um, because I found it very interesting, all the things that were happening behind the scenes that I really had no idea. I was right. class of 97. Right. Um, but what I really want to know is when is volume three coming out? Uh, I, it's not going to be written by me. So I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. But thank you for reading it. Hope you liked it. Have you read the first volume? Oh, yeah. I read that <laughs> earlier in the pandemic. And yeah. then I took a break in between and read yeah. some fiction. And then yeah. I picked up volume two after that. <laughs> Thank you for reading it. Thank you. Forgive the mistakes in it. Liddell Payne went to Stanford. For some reason, I wrote a different university, and I'm still mortified by it. Can I tell I my didn't notice any mistakes? I'm sorry? I didn't notice any mistakes. So. Well, thank you. You're very kind. Can I tell my Moreland story? Yes. Anybody of you had Moreland? Do you remember Moreland? Moreland was the president before Luther White. He was very important. <clears throat> he, he turned the college around. He expanded it a great deal. But he had the odd, odd quality. He was always right. And he was once traveling through with the, the director of development through Pulaski. And Moreland said, Pulaski, wasn't he a great Indian chief? And the other man said, Dr. Moreland Pulaski was a Polish general who served in the American Revolutionary Army. And Moreland said, that was the other one. So, <laughs> so Moreland was always right. But my Moreland story, when I was doing research for the first volume, I was reading through the Moreland papers in Peel Hall, because that's where they were. 
Moreland governed by flattery. He didn't have money for faculty. So he praised everybody constantly. And I read a letter from Moreland that was over the top, more purple even than Moreland normally wrote. And Moreland came in and I said, Dr. Moreland, well, let me tell you about the letter before I tell you what it, the conversation. The first paragraph was, I don't know what I would do as president if I did not have your counsel and guidance. I value you tremendously and you are the most important source of wisdom that I have. This went on for a paragraph. Second paragraph, even though your idea is a very good idea, I'm afraid our financial resources do not allow us to implement it this time, but you're wonderful, on and on and on. So Moreland came in and I said, Dr. Moreland, you had a trustee and I mentioned the man's name, I don't remember it now. Moreland didn't take a breath. A jackass, sir. He was a jackass. He gave me more problems than all the other rest of the board combined. And so the moral of that story is you read your sources and you pray the person who wrote them is telling the truth and you can't tell. So anyway, it's been wonderful talking to you. I've been worried about it, but I had every faith that you would be just as lovely. Yeah. And I wanna say one thing, the first day I came here for an interview, I walked around looking over the joint and three students passed my way and every one of them said hello to me. And until the COVID, I, you, brace yourselves, before the COVID, I used to go to the gym three times a week and I would run into students and they were always very pleasant. And ironically, one day I was walking to the gym and I tripped and fell, which is not unusual in itself anymore. And three Randolph-Macon students saw me and they literally came running to help me out. And two of them helped me over to uh, the Brock Commons where I could pester Barclay. But the lovely quality of students, unless you're doing their grading their exams, the lovely quality of students, as far as I can tell, no longer teaching is still there. So please come back and see us. If you haven't been on campus in a while, it's transformed. Uh, go to the website. And if we don't have pictures of the buildings, we should have them. And, and we should have a, a drone fly around and show it. it. It's a different place. But I think, I think the essential character of the college of the intimacy and the closeness is still there. So well, come and see me. I live four blocks away. You can come and see me. It's real easy to get to my house. Well, Dr. Scanlon, we greatly appreciate you joining us today. It's Again, been my I pleasure. Think there needs to be a part two of this, but everybody else who joined us, thank you very much. Again, next Friday, we'll have April Marchetti, but you can find all the information about upcoming speakers at www.rmc.edu slash alumni. And right there on the page, you'll see our uh, next speakers. So we do hope to see you back on campus. Um, there's a lot going on here, as Dr. Scanlon said, and, and we're all excited that our alumni are a part of the success of this college, and um, we hope to see you back here. So thank you all, and Dr. Scanlon, thank you very much. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you, Jay. Thank everyone. you so much, Dr. Scanlon. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye, Yeah. Good to see you. How terrific. Oh, thank you. I need to go to the bathroom. I'll be back. If you... Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh. Margaret. Hey. That was amazing. I'm so glad. It sounded really great. Um, do you want to pop into the hallway and maybe 
stay low or 